gently tilted. They're kind of scooped up. And those big, uh, those big rock plates or those big blocks of rock at the bottom are almost like a train scooping up a cow. So we're gonna watch a short video which shows that. It's gonna be a high speed summary of the uplift and uh, faulting events. So each one of these layers is uh, just sand, but they represent the sedimentary layers. And you can see this mountain building kind of going on the left of your screen. And those vertical rocks are now being tilted up and exposed. And as erosion occurs, they're gonna be exposed on the face. This is how we get things like Garden of the Gods in Red Rock Canyon, all the way up to the flat irons up in Boulder. And you can see at the very end, we're left with those uh, rocks sticking up. And then on the left-hand side, that would have been a nice little example of Pikes Peak. So we're left with these tilted up rocks. And then after those rocks are tilted up, you can also have more deposition. And that's what we would see when we're looking at like some of the rocks at Palmer Park or some of the other areas in like Denver. So a little bit of that background. Now let's look at some diagrams and then we'll get into the actual hike. So what we've got here on the left-hand side is all those different units of rock. And you can see again, for the most part, they're kind of that almost up and down, uh, those layers going left to right, oldest to youngest, west to east. And those represent the layers that you can see on your screen on the right-hand side. So we start really with the fountain formation going up through all those others until we get to the Pierre Shale. And uh, then we are gonna have some other sequences. As you can see, Austin Bluffs is like the D1 sequence. So we end up with things like the Laramie Formation, Dawson R Coast and things like that. But since they're not part of Red Rock Canyon, we won't talk too much about them. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of how big these layers are and the scale of what we're talking about. Uh, the fountain formation is actually below sea level except where it has been tilted upright by that faulting action and that uplift. So you feel like we've got that, you know, two kilometers, so about a mile and a half. That's how thick these layers we're talking about are. And that, that makes sense. If you look at the left to right of Red Rock Canyon, how thick are those layers? So we're gonna start, and the way we're gonna do this hike is I'm gonna kind of show you where in the park they are and also where we can look at them. So we're gonna start with the Pikes Peak Granite. This is gonna be really the only non-sedimentary rock we're gonna talk about. Uh, Pikes Peak Granite, best place to see it is really anywhere on the very kind of southwestern edge, but I really enjoy the Palmer Red Rock Trail. And Pikes Peak Granite is actually what we call a batholith. Um, sounds like I'm saying basilisk or something like that, but it's uh, really just a giant bubble of rock. If you can imagine, if you turn on a lava lamp, as it starts warming up that wax on the inside, you get a column pushing up. And as that column pushes up, it slowly cools and eventually can harden. Um, and eventually it warms up enough that you get those nice bubbles forming. But that first step, you've got that vertical column. So in the diagram that we can see, we have a magma chamber. That is the top of that batholith column. And as it cools down and hardens, then it becomes a batholith. And over time, it can be exposed either due to erosion of the surrounding strata or because you've got an uplift event that brings it up, like we saw uh, about 70 million years ago here. Pikes Peak Granite is really cool stuff. It's made out of this beautiful pink material. This is potassium feldspar. So feldspar is kind of a group of minerals. Uh, this one just happens to be potassium based. We also have uh, black mica called biotite. And then we've got our grayish or white smoky quartz. And we do find some really nice examples of that. Uh, if we have any mineralogists or rock hounds here, the feldspar also has a variety that is kind of a beautiful blue turquoise. And that is our amazonite. And that's just due, some, due to some impurities. But if you put those three minerals together by their powers combined, they're Pikes Peak Granite. Uh, so that was uh, formed about a billion years ago. And then over time, uh, we actually had a little bit of exposed and then it eroded away and we transitioned to more of a depositional environment. So this is our first sedimentary layer. This is the fountain formation. This is gonna be a Western third of our park or our open space. And uh, some of the best places to see this are gonna be along the contemplative trail, right up by the main parking lot. So we're also gonna be looking at some maps. This is what the world looked like about 300 to 320 million years ago. Um, it's a little bit unrecognizable. Most of the continents are not really in their current shape, but the plates still exist. And something to keep in mind as we look at these maps is that environment is dictated largely by latitude. So it's not a coincidence that over by the equator, you have a lot of rainfall and then you've got these bands of dry arid either steppe or savanna or even desert climates uh, about 30 degrees north and south of the equator. 
Uh, that's because you have these convection currents that are going and they lift the air up near the equator and that air cools down, drops all of its precipitation, cycles to that 30 degree latitude, and then it comes back down and starts picking up moisture and then transports it back to the equator and that cycle repeats. And that's important because about 300 million years ago, this is where Colorado was. We're actually right down by the equator. So we were a pretty tropical environment. What that meant is we have these enormous alluvial fans. Um, if you guys have ever driven up in the mountains, you've probably seen little examples of these. They're essentially like a river delta, but they're forming at the base of mountains where these rivers come down out of the mountains, carrying a bunch of sediment, gravel, sand, mud, things like that. And then they hit a flat area. And as that water slows down, it loses its ability to carry stuff. And so all that material kind of drops out and you're left with these big wedge or delta shaped fan shapes. And that's all that material that's being deposited. So this is a video of what Colorado looks like. And you can see we're actually kind of a uh, archipelago of, of different, different island chains. So we've got like Front Rangia is gonna be that island that's kind of near Denver that extends down to Colorado Springs. Uncompagre is a little bit to the west. And those are just fun names based on the current, uh, rock, or current Rocky Mountains that we have today. And then we have an artist depiction of what the environment looks like. So we can see a lot of braided streams coming down off of these mountains and the archipelagos as they get closer to the seashore. Uh, we don't have a lot of recognizable plants and some of our critters that we see, we'll see a video of. And these guys kind of look like dinosaurs. Uh, they're actually proto reptiles. They're uh, older than dinosaurs. So these layers, again, older than the dinosaurs themselves. We can see all those nice cobbles, those river rock. These videos, by the way, are from the uh, University of Colorado up in Boulder. They've got a really cool program where they are putting all these three-dimensional uh, simulations together of the different paleoecology of Colorado. So a big credit to the University of Colorado Interactive Geology Project. And so what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for those big fins on the very western side of Red Rock Canyon open space. And again, these are a lot like the flat irons up in Boulder or the uh, balanced rock and Siamese twins over Garden of the Gods. And we're looking at kind of this mix of different sizes and shapes. We have a lot of sand, a lot of fine gravel, maybe some mud. And you guys can see these cobbles, these uh, medium or even large sized rocks that are mixed in. And that shows us that there's a water environment that was able to carry that material down from the Rocky Mountains and deposit it. And we can see, you know, we've got our bands of, uh, we've got some cobble there on kind of the upper right. And then we've got that kind of bacon looking stuff kind of center right. And that kind of shows you your different muds, your different sands, and those are all coming together to form this fountain formation. And it's a little bit tricky to see here, but we also have some cross bedding. So that's another clue that you're looking at a sedimentary rock and we do see it in the fountain formation. What we're looking at, if you can see on the right hand side, there's some vertical lines and you might be able to see it a little bit better in gray and white. And then kind of on the left portion of the uh, picture, we've got some, some lines going up at maybe a 30 degree angle. So we'll see if this helps you guys. Can you see them? And those are showing us that we've got, uh, again, depositional events. And each time the water pulses and comes down with flooding events, it's gonna leave a different layer. And as the water leaves those layers, it creates those different striations and angles to each other. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our next layer. So that is our fountain formation. Next, we get to maybe our most famous formation, our lion's formation. Uh, all of these are named after towns, by the way. So fountain is named after Fountain, Colorado. Lions is named after Lions, which is kind of up near uh, the entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park below, uh, below, oh, I forgot the name of the town there. Goodness, it was right in my head. Anyway, uh, right below Rocky Mountain National Park. And some great places to see this are anywhere along the Red Rock Canyon Trail. Uh, this is gonna be best because you're actually walking between two subunits of the Lions Formation. So at this point in time, Colorado is about here. And if you remember our diagram, well, now we've moved up in latitude closer to that 30 degrees. And so the environment is a lot drier. I think of it kind of like the Gobi Desert or uh, maybe the Namib Desert in Africa. And there's some debate or disagreement about what color the sand was, but uh, I tend to think it's more of a reddish color. That reddish color may have come after that sand was deposited though. 
So here's an artist's depiction of what the world looked like. And again, in this picture, the sand is a little bit whiter. We do have some areas where maybe a little bit of water was able to come through, but by and large, it was a very dry, fairly inhospitable climate. And another artist's uh, depiction of what this might have looked like. Uh, we do know that there was water in the Lyons Formation, and that's because we do find little bands of conglomerate, which is that same rock we saw in the Fountain Formation with those cobbles. I like to think that if you really want to get a good idea of what it was like here in Colorado 280 million years ago, you can actually just go right over to the sand dunes. And so here's a picture from the Red Rock Canyon trail area. And we've actually got three different subunits of the lion formation that are exposed here. We've got our lower unit, which is gonna be west or oldest. And that's why it's called lower, even though they're tilted upright. Remember their original orientation, this would have been on the bottom. We've got our middle lions and that's really soft. So it's pretty much eroded away. And it leaves this valley between the two layers but there's a handful of places we can see it. And then we've got our upper lions, which is again, gonna be on the east. So this is a southward view. But we're going to talk about our lower lions first. Uh, the lower lions also has some really great example of that cross bedding. This is all going to be a sandstone, by the way. It's going to be a uh, wind blown environment. So just as you could see, it's a desert. Uh, the sand is going to be very fine grained, and we know it's wind blown because of that uniform size, showing us, showing us that the wind was able to carry it rather than water, and also because of the spherical nature of that sand. It's very rounded because it's been polished by that tumbling action in the wind. And again, we've got that cross bedding, so you can see those nice little striations. Um, one of the things that's really cool about Red Rock Canyon is we have the old historic quarry where blocks were cut out. And so rather than waiting for these, these striations to erode out, we can get a perfect cross-section view of them. And as we look at that cross-section view, you might start to notice that some of those striations, they're not quite straight lines, they're curved. And uh, they'll actually have almost like a hockey stick shape to them. And the reason for that is, again, because of the depositional environment. Each one of these different layers was deposited one after another in a sequence. So here we can see, I think we're up to five different depositional events. And for me, that's really cool to be able to see not only we've got this cross bedding, uh, but it also tells the story of, okay, this wind event show, uh, these wind events created different depositional events over time. So we'll move on to our middle lion member of the uh, lion formation. And this is really a soft mudstone or a siltstone, uh, hence why there's not a lot of it left. This stuff erodes super easily. You can see, maybe you can see in this picture, there's some grasses growing there. It's basically compacted soil to call it a rock would be kind of generous. There are some places where we have conglomerates and you can even see maybe some ripples in this photo. So that shows that we did have some moving water in the area. And then we go into our upper lion and our upper lion, upper lion's formation or member of the formation. Uh, it's very similar. It's the same sandstone as that lower unit. And it has the same kind of cross bedding, but something that is a little bit different about it is you can see it's a little bleached in places. Uh, the white rock at Garden of the Gods is made out of this upper unit. And we also get these cracks that then fill in with other minerals over millions of years. And so these are evidence of that bending and faulting as the earth moved around. Uh, so if you ever drive through Garden of the Gods and look at gray rock, it's full of these features and fissures. And if you're walking up the Red Rock Canyon Trail Garden, or at Red Rock Canyon, and you look to your left, you'll be able to see that as well. We're going to move on to the lichens formation. Uh, the best place to look for the lichens formation is uh, a little bit hard to get to. Uh, one of the first places you can find it, though, is the Red Rock Rim Trail. But Section 16 and the... Uh, the Red Rock Canyon Scenic Overlook Trail, so those two on the bottom, those are great places to see it, and it's beautifully exposed there. And actually, one of the easiest places to see it is right off of Highway 24. If you've driven through that road cut right there before you go to Red Rock Canyon, you're going to get to see the Lion Formation, that sandstone, and then right before that to the east, if you're coming from the east, is that Lichens Formation. So this is what the world looked like. Again, uh, pretty unrecognizable. We might be starting to pick out a little bit of South America and Africa merged together at the bottom there, but pretty hard to pick out who's who. Colorado's here. And this would have been the environment at the time. So this is a, a really bad time to be on planet Earth, to be frank. Um, and in Colorado, especially, we're a super hot environment. 
Uh, daytime highs would have commonly reached 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it did have water, but unfortunately the water was super salty, hypersaline. So it's almost like the Dead Sea or someplace like that. So an artist reconstruction, what that might've looked like with those salty lagoons. Uh, what you're looking at are actually almost like a uh, algae version of coral. We call them stromatolites. They're a photosynthetic bacteria or algae, and they grow in layers, building almost like a skeleton layer, kind of like a, uh, a coral reef does. And that's going to be one of the unique and identifying markers of this lichens formation. By and large, most of the lichen formation is what we call a red bed. So here's the red rock rim trail cutting through that. And you can see it's, it's just red, almost soil, but it's a, a siltstone or a mudstone. But you can see those little outcrops of that white stuff at the bottom. And what that is, those are our stromatolites. So this is uh, one of those almost kind of rounded shapes, those domes that you saw. This one's broken apart and shows almost a cross section. So beautiful example of a stromatolite. Uh, more commonly, what you'll see are these wavy shapes, those deposition as the algae grew layer upon layer upon itself, leaving those very thin layers of it's a, uh, basically a limestone or a dolomite behind. Now we're gonna move into where the fun critters start to show up in my opinion. We're in the Morrison Formation. Um, there is a large gap in the Earth's history between the lichens and the Morrison. We're skipping ahead over a hundred million years at this point in time. So we're missing a big chunk of the Earth's story and uh, mostly the Triassic, which is when dinosaurs, dinosaurs start showing up. The best place to see the Morrison, I think is actually gonna be at the road cut of the old landfill road or along the Lion Trail. And that's simply because we cut into the hillside there and that allows us to see it. Unfortunately, if you guys can see kind of that pale orange shape in the middle of the map next to my arrow, that's the old landfill. And that old landfill uh, fills a valley or a canyon that was about 180 feet deep at its deepest. And all of that was the valley that got carved out as the Morrison Formation was eroded away because it's a very soft layer. Uh, unfortunately, what that means is most of the Morrison Formation in Red Rock Canyon is buried under the landfill. And so it's uh, inaccessible to us. And the Morrison Formation is very famous for having a lot of dinosaur fossils. So we don't know if there might've been dinosaur fossils before they got buried up by trash. And now we're starting to get to a point when the earth is looking a little bit more um, recognizable. We can start to see our continents and you can see Colorado was actually pretty close to a seaway. So it's just up north there in Wyoming and into the Dakotas. So an artist reconstruction of what Colorado would have looked like um, is a fairly arid environment, not desert, but um, actually kind of similar to what we have today, although maybe a little bit warmer. And we had rivers that were flowing down off of the, you know, fairly flat land, but what was left of those uh, Rocky Mountains that used to be there and flowing and draining into that seaway that was up in Wyoming. And what we had was basically a savanna, a uh, open, you know, somewhat dry, but not completely arid meadow-like environment. And tromping around this meadow environment would have been the largest dinosaurs uh, and some really cool stuff, which we'll get to see in a moment. Also, this would have been the real Jurassic Park. So if you went and visited the real Jurassic Park, you might have got to see some critters like Allosaurus. And uh, that Allosaurus might have been hunting a Stegosaurus, one of his favorite prey items. And you would have had these uh, little theropods like our Camptosaurus. And something that's really interesting is there is scientific evidence that the Stegosaurus and the Camptosaurus might have moved together, uh, even though they're different species. And they think that might have been because the Stegosaurus had defensive ability. So it's got the spikes on its tail that it can uh, use to defend itself. But maybe not great eyesight, but the Camptosaurus had better eyesight and could almost act like a sentry. And then those Stegosaurus would act as kind of the, the muscle or the defense. And like I said, this is the time when we have the largest dinosaurs. We've got our sauropods, like our uh, Brachiosaurus and our Apatosaurus. Something also uh, that I think is really interesting, there's some new evidence that shows that our Allosaurus, uh, which is about the size of a T-Rex, but much stronger forelimbs, uh, they didn't have the strongest skulls. And so they don't know if it could have survived a ton of uh, bite force on its lower jaw, but the teeth could, could deal with serious impact. So there's maybe some evidence that they almost like went around and aggressively nodded at their prey because they were using their upper jaw almost like a hatchet to swing down on their prey items. And so what we're looking at for the Morrison Formation is a combination of, it's called a variegated clay. What that means is it's just different colors. So we've got some maroons and purples, there's tans and grays, and even some almost uh, slightly 
cyan, a um, little bit greenish color in that gray clay. And then there's also going to be some sandstones. So in this picture, we can see a little bit of both. The big blocky units at the bottom are that sandstone. The purple and white stuff is that clay, but we do have some chunks of that sandstone interspersed throughout. And then uh, as we get out of the Jurassic period, we're going to fast forward about 40 million years. We're going to get into the Purgatoire Formation. So this is the early Cretaceous. The best places to see this, it's a pretty thin layer, by the way. The best place to see this is going to be right up here off of the Landfill Road, where it meets up with the Lion Trail and the Upper Codell Trail. Um, this is one of my favorite spots to look at geology, and we'll get to see why in just a moment. But highly recommend visiting this. It's worth the trek up to the top of the hill. So we're really getting into kind of a recognizable map. Uh, Colorado would have been at the edge of a seaway that's uh, coming down from the Arctic Ocean and eventually would cover a big chunk of North America. And the Purgatoire Formation, we get into an environment where it's a little bit more moist. And so we are in kind of a coastal forest environment with large dinosaurs. Uh, the most famous, at least locally, would have been this little guy. This is Theophytalia, which is the Garden of the Gods dinosaur. The Theophytalia literally means Garden of the Gods. Um, this is discovered in that same layer, the Purgatoire Formation, up at Garden of the Gods. Uh, it's really hard to find that layer up there, and so I actually personally think it's a lot easier and better to look at if you're going down to Red Rock Canyon open space. To my knowledge, no dinosaur fossils found in Red Rock Canyon yet at uh, the Purgatoire Formation. So. And that guy was running away from that dinosaur we saw earlier, that Acrocanthosaurus, which was 5% smaller than a T-Rex, but uh, a pretty big predator. And what we're looking for with that Purgatoire Formation, there's actually two units. There's the Lytle and the Glencairn. And the left, the Lytle is more of a sandstone. The Glencairn is a shale, but let's talk about the Lytle first. This might look kind of familiar. Uh, this looks a lot like the Morrison Formation. So on the bottom, we can see that same kind of variegated clay, that mudstone, and then up above, we've got some sandstone. And it's very hard to tell apart. Um, the easiest way I can think of is if you're up at that spot that we were just looking at, there is a little kind of bumpy dark maroon layer that separates the two. And on the kind of eastern side of that layer, you'll be able to see that the Lytle formation, it's a sandstone, but it's also got gravel mixed in in little bands. And so that shows that we had some kind of, again, water environment bringing some, uh, some gravels down. And they're pretty well polished. Uh, they almost look like they've gone, they've gone through a rock tumbler. And they range anywhere from pea size up to maybe golf ball size or so. The other unit of the Purgatoire Formation is the Glencairn, which is just a shale. Um, this is a pretty dark gray, almost black in places. And what this is, is when that Western Seaway was coming in, uh, the Western Interior Seaway, it left uh, a lot of the mud and stuff from that, that shoreline environment. So this represents the first pulse of the Western Interior Seaway that would later cover all of Colorado and much of America. You can see again, we're, we're going west to east. The next one is our Dakota Formation. The Dakota Formation is the large, tall hogback that you can see through most of Red Rock Canyon open space. And if you're looking at Red Rock from the east, uh, it's going to be that tall fin that you're looking at of that kind of tan or buff colored rock. I'm going to recommend two places to look at this. One is the same place that we were just looking at the Purgatoire, but you can also hike along to the uh, Red Rock Canyon Rim Trail, and that's going to be just above 31st Street. And that'll show you some really cool features in the Dakota Formation. So again, we're at that basically the same environment, that coastal environment with a little bit of a seaway coming in. And we're in that kind of uh, coastal, maybe some salt marshes, some swamps or marshes, uh, almost like a mangrove environment today. And then our beach shoreline on the right hand side. So here we have an artist reconstruction of what that would have looked like. We've got our dinosaurs meandering back and forth, having a nice day at the beach. Um, but it's actually kind of cool. You can imagine, look at that nice wide stretch of sand compared to that very dense forest. So it's easier for them to move around on those beaches. We've got a lot of evidence that they use those beaches almost like highways. And because we're on kind of that shoreline and that shore ran north and south, 
that allowed them to migrate back and forth using those beaches as a almost like a, a corridor. And we know this because we find those tracks in some of our other areas where the Dakota Formation is exposed, like up at Dinosaur Ridge. So this would be uh, what where you'd see some of our Cretaceous dinosaurs showing up. So we've got critters like our ankylosaurs. We find their tracks down in Canyon City. Uh, so if you do Skyline Drive, you're going to be looking at that guy's tracks. Some of our famous little raptors. This is one of my favorite guys. This is Deinonychus. And no relation, Deinosicus, which would have been a giant crocodile. The Dina just means terrible. So terrible claw versus terrible crocodile. The Dakota Formation is really easy to identify. It's kind of this uh, orangish buff cream color, but it's also got these little uh, spheres all throughout. And what those are are concretions. They're just areas where the iron in the rock kind of naturally clumped together. And these two that we're looking at have actually been broken in half, so you can kind of see the interior. But you can also have ones that they've fallen out or they're left intact. And they're just like little marbles. I actually had a visitor a couple months ago ask me uh, if like we ever watched Ancient Aliens because they wondered if aliens left these, these perfect little spheres all around the park. We do some see some evidence of uh, the ancient environment here. We've got some uh, piece of petrified wood, driftwood, things like that. And we do see fern fossils that also show us this is again a coastal forest environment. And we've also got ripples, and these ripples are a little bit different in shape from what we might see in some of the other places. Because they've got two sides to them, uh, those ripples tell us that this was a back and forth motion rather than a flowing motion. So that tells us we've got a beach environment. And there's a lot of ripples. Uh, this is why I recommend going to that spot kind of near 31st Street. There's a whole wall that's maybe 20 feet tall and 50 or 60 feet wide just full of these ripples and they can be going in kind of slightly different directions depending on how the waves were, were being pushed that day or that month. And this is why I recommend going to that top hillside where you've got that intersection of the Lion Trail, the Landfill Road and that uh, Upper Codell Trail because we can see actually all three of these layers in sequence. We've got our Morrison Formation from the Jurassic period we can see our Lytle and our Glen Cairn members of the Purgatoire Formation from the early Cretaceous, as well as this Dakota in the Cretaceous. And the Dakota and the Morrison are kind of on the edges of this, but as you go around that corner, you can see all three of those very nicely. We're going to move into uh, where that seaway continued to get deeper. So the Benton Shale, this is that large valley that is just to the east of the Dakota Formation, uh, but not quite to that next little ridge that is going to be up at the edge of the property on the east side. So you can uh, view this from the Hogback Valley Trail or even a little bit getting up onto the Codell Trail on those ridge tops. I again really like to go just above 31st Street. Uh, there's some really nice exposures of it there. In other places, uh, actually, sorry, getting ahead of myself. This is what the earth looked like, and this would have been in that neighborhood of about 80 million years ago. Colorado is completely underwater, so we're starting to get from a shallower to a deeper to a deeper sea during this time. And so there's not a lot to see <laughs> except for water, unless you go under the water. We might have had some flying reptiles flying around hunting for fish, but really most of the action would have been underwater. So we've got critters like our ammonites. Uh, we've got our uh, elasmosaurus, so those long-necked marine reptiles hunting for fish, and even giant sharks. Uh, the largest one of those is Cretoxy rhina, uh, so that's what's pictured here. This would have been quite a bit bigger than a great white, maybe about 30 feet long. So if you're familiar with Megalodon, maybe not quite that big, but still a massive shark with three-inch teeth. And so one of the easy ways to identify this, in other places, the uh, Benton Shale is differentiated into different units, but here at Red Rock Canyon, it's a little bit smushed together. Uh, so what we are left with is basically this undifferentiated black shale. And it's, again, to call shale a rock, I, I, I feel like we should name this presentation why West doesn't like shale. But uh, shale is kind of holding together, but not really. And as it gets exposed, it erodes very quickly, falls and breaks apart. It's very soft, very crumbly. But you can find very small exposures of it, and you can see it's this very thin, flaky rock. Um, this picture is maybe two inches worth of sediment, maybe an inch and a half. 
And one of the things that's really cool about the Benton Shale is we can use this for uh, dating. We can figure out how old the rock is because that white band running right through the middle of it is actually volcanic ash. These were volcanoes that erupted in California, and this allows us to uh, date how old this rock is. So we're able to get a very precise date too, about 77 million years. We do have little fish scales and things like that. And then at the very top of that Benton Shale, there's a layer of, it almost looks like a sandstone. It looks very similar to the, the, to the Dakota Formation, um, but we're actually gonna be running into something that is, uh, it's actually a limestone. And this limestone is made up of very fine particles of calcium carbonate, the mineral that makes up limestone. But those very fine particles, they almost feel like a sand, but chemically it's a limestone. And in that, uh, this layer is by the way called the Codel, and it's a member of that Benton shell, but we've got our ammonites. So these would have been the guy that we saw earlier, that curly shell with almost like a squid face poking out. Uh, and it, the whole layer is just made up of itty bitty fragmentary fossils. So on the left is gonna be a uh, oyster shell and on the right is a small shark tooth. As the seaway got deeper, we ended up with uh, almost like a chalk formation. So if you can think of the uh, famous White Cliffs of Dover, we have our own miniature version of that with the Niobrara Formation. You can see the Niobrara Formation, same area, right above 31st Street, there's some nice outcrops. And you can also see it anywhere along the lower Codell Trail. Uh, if you're looking at it from Fairview Cemetery, it's those big white uh, outcrops. They almost look like perfectly flat white faces from the east. Um, I live over by Palmer Park and I can see those on my drive in some days. So Colorado is still underwater. And we do have uh, some fun critters, really the only dinosaurs we see. We have fossil evidence of dinosaurs that got washed out to sea and were then predated on by sharks. So we've actually found dinosaur bones with shark teeth embedded in them in this formation out in Kansas, which is pretty cool. So if we were to take a visit, we'd go scuba diving. We'd see things like Xyphactinus. This is a large tarpon-like fish, maybe 15 to 20 feet long. So, I mean, this is the size of a great white shark. We've got our elasmosaurs. It might be 40, 45, 50 feet long. We've got our uh, flying reptiles up above hunting for small fish. And we've got our sharks that are eating our dinosaurs that get washed out and a whole bunch of other things. What we're looking for with the Niobrara Formation are these layers of chalk. They're very bright white, maybe a hint of that cream color, but really pretty white. And there's not really a lot of uh, easily identifiable particulate. It's, it's pretty well smushed together because the particulate that makes this up is so fine. It's again, it's like a chalk. And then the last layer that we're going to see uh, uplifted at Red Rock Canyon is our Pierre Shale. The Pierre Shale is still from a marine environment, and you can look at it at the same place uh, right by 31st Street. So still underwater. And this is when we get some of our gnarliest creatures, our largest marine reptiles live in this period, our mosasaurs. Uh, these guys, they think, might be related to monitor lizards, so potentially pretty smart critters. Um, and aggressive hunters, and these would have gotten absolutely enormous. So this is a, uh, I think it's a Tylosaur, which would have been the largest, and these guys get to like 55 feet. They call them the T-Rex of the Western Interior Seaway, but that doesn't really do them justice. These guys would have been almost twice as long, and they would have been many, many times heavier. So truly enormous animals. Think of today's like sperm whales for comparison. And the Pierre Shale, it's uh, outcropped just in a couple spots, but it's very thick. It's uh, many hundreds of meters thick. And so you can actually find it all the way off of like Uinta and 19th Street over by that King Supers there. There's a cut in Uinta that you can drive through and see the Pierre Shale. So there's quite a bit of it. Uh, but it's a very crumbly shale. And some of you, if you're uh, local to town, might also remember a bunch of the houses that were starting to slump down on the sides of the hill, kind of on the western edge of town. It's because they built them on this pier shale, which is not a very strong material. And we're going to kind of rewind. You remember I talked about how the Rocky Mountains pushed up, scooped our, our layers upright. And so that's when this happens. Those mountains start pushing up. We get our current Rocky Mountains through the layer mitorogeny. It scoops our layers up into a vertical orientation. And then over time, we've got more layers that are laid down on top of those. So again, just a little bit of a refresher. We've got all our layers 
they're tilted up right on the left. And then we've got our Fox Hill Sandstone, Laramie Formation, and our two D sequences. And those are what we're going to find over at Austin Bluffs, Palmer Park, places like that. So not part of Red Rock Canyon, but they are worth checking out. We've got a geologic map of Colorado Springs here. You can see all that stuff over on the left side by Manitou. That's what we've been talking about so far. But these other layers are flat, and so we have bluffs where they've been eroded by rivers and streams. And we end up with, uh, like, Ute Valley has some great exposure to these layers, as does Palmer Park. And you can even go up to Castlewood Canyon up near Castle Rock. That's a really great place to look at some of these layers. And Corral Bluffs is really cool as well. That actually records the uh, KT sequence, which is when the dinosaurs died. And there's a great documentary on Nova about that. So that's another one of the properties that my department manages. Um, try not to go off on too much of a tangent there, but highly recommend checking out the Nova documentary on Corral Bluffs as well. And it talks about the rise of the mammals, and that's the name of it. So we're gonna fast forward because the only layer that we have left to talk about is not really a rock layer, it's just a sediment layer of gravel. Uh, so we call them the Mesa gravels, they're also called the Piedmont gravel. And these are just the layers that came down in the last 20 or 30,000 years. The best place I think to see them is right by the parking lot at the picnic lot there. And we'll get to see a picture of it momentarily. But really, we're almost to modern day. We're only about 20 or 30,000 years ago. Colorado's right where we expect it to be. The only thing that's different is this was during the Ice Age. So Colorado had a number of glaciers, especially up on the mountains, and Pikes Peak had a couple of small glaciers as well. As those glaciers, uh, so we've got our critters roaming around, so we've got our Columbian mammoths, our mastodons. Uh, you can see we've got some camels roaming around. As those glaciers melted though, they brought rivers and streams down from the mountains and they left these deposits of gravel and cobbles and big river rocks. And this looks kind of familiar. It looks a lot like the fountain formation because it's the same generic process. It's water coming off the mountains, coming to a flatter environment, slowing down and dropping all these different material. And um, this is a beautiful example. You can see kind of near the bottom, and it's overlying the lion sandstone here, but that bottom layer, we've got those really big chunks and so that shows that we must have had a lot of energy. I think the biggest cobbles I've seen there are like two feet in diameter. So think about how big a river has to be to be consistently moving two foot boulders around. And then as we get higher and higher up, maybe as the glaciers kind of waned away, uh, we end up with finer and finer material. So let's get back to the present. A couple of the resources I use that I highly, highly recommend, uh, the Geologic Folio of Red Rock Canyon. Uh, and I do not get a, uh, a consignment for, for recommending these, but the Red Rock Canyon Folio is an amazing resource. I use this on a daily basis just through rangering. Uh, like I said, the Interactive Geology product by, a Project by the University of Colorado up in Boulder has some really cool visualizations. I'd recommend checking that website out just so you can view it and see what you're looking at and uh, see what the world looks like. Ancient Denver is a book that was published by the uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And it has a lot of the illustrations that I relied on and is also a great way to kind of just view at a glance what Colorado used to look like. And then that blog I mentioned from the American Geophysical Union, uh, they've got a lot of great articles. So if you are an amateur budding geologist like myself, you can learn a bunch of stuff. I was uh, doing research for this program. I've been working at Garden of the Gods in Red Rock Canyon for about 10 years now. And I still learned a bunch of stuff by reading that blog today, or last couple of weeks, I should say. We are working on creating a real life guided or self-guided hike through Red Rock Canyon open space. And uh, I will send this link to you via Zoom, but uh, we have a short survey. It's not very long. I think it should look something like this online. And you can see it's mostly just rating if you agree or disagree with comments. And there's gonna be a handful where it's asked you for your brief opinion, um, but that would really help us out because that link or that survey is gonna allow us to develop the content for a self-guided loop. And it will include a number of panels as you walk along and we're looking at what you wanna learn about in those panels. So today was kind of a brief taste of that. And like I said, I will put that in the Zoom link. All right, so, wow, 45 minutes on the nose. It's like I've done this before.
<laughs> well, thank you guys so much for joining me on this uh, virtual hike today. I do hope that I'll be able to uh, see you guys someday out here in the next few months or maybe year as things we get back to our normal and uh, get to do some real life guided hikes. Um, that is my favorite thing to do because A, I get to be outside, but B, I get to geek out like I have today. And uh, I'm sending that link to you. If you guys would not mind, that would really, really help us out. The more information we get, um, the more we will be able to develop that content and give you guys what you are interested in. Um, because my goal as a park ranger is to connect you with your parks and open spaces and have you be passionate and uh, be able to share that passion with you. So I will rewind a little bit in the chat, see if I can find some questions. And uh, if you have a question, there's a little raise your hand uh, icon, I think. And you can also uh, type, type in the chat. Uh, Ken and Judith, you know what? I actually forgot to hit the record button, so I did not record it. I don't know if Heidi did, um, but thank you, Ken and Judith. I did record. It was just a few minutes late, and we'll have that recording up. I'd say by Monday, it takes a little bit of time for us to edit and then post it to YouTube, so I can email the link to everyone um, right. for that recording. Excellent. That uh, Liz, that's a great question. What determines how the sedimentary layers are grouped into formations? Really, it has to do with um, are they going to be kind of a contiguous unit? And also, are they being deposited in that same environment or that same time span? So you remember I said that the Purgatoire Formation and then you've got your Dakota Formation. Uh, there's actually some debate. Some people are saying maybe that Lytle and Glencairn member of the quote-unquote Purgatoire might be part of the Dakota Formation. So um, it depends on the geologist you ask, really. <laughs> but uh, really what it has to do with, does it record a specific chapter of the Earth's history? What environment was being uh, recorded in that environment? Hope that answers it. Uh, Janet, I think that it's more of a chemical reaction. So it's kind of like they just naturally attract each other. Not so much, I, I, but to be honest, I don't know. Um, I've had it explained to me as it's more of a chemical process where they just kind of clump together. And then we did have a question that came just to me. Um, and yeah. Where is Petwood? I don't know if that means. Um... Yeah, that's a great question. So I always need to be careful when I describe where things are. Um, we used to have an Ankylosaur track at Red Rock Canyon Open Space. Used to. Unfortunately, it was stolen about uh, 15 years ago, something like that. So we, we need to be very careful with disclosing the location of our paleontological uh, resources. I will say, um, any of the fossils I just mentioned that are going to be viewable in Red Rock Canyon open space, you can buy for a couple of dollars at any decent rock shop. Um, so I, I can't really describe a location for that reason and also the fact that it's scattered throughout. So if you are looking at some of the places where the trail goes through, there's a really good chance you'll be able to see it anywhere in that Dakota formation because it is scattered throughout just little pieces of driftwood. Um, so very vague, non-committal semi-answer. <laughs> All right, I'm just continuing to scroll through. I don't have a name, but uh, 254343, how do we sign up for guided hikes? That's a great question. I would highly recommend you follow the City of Carter Springs Parks, Recreation, Cultural Services on Facebook or other social media. Um, if you're not on those though, you can also uh, find us, I believe we advertise that. I'll see if I can find the link. Uh, if you wanna stick around for a few minutes after the presentation, I'll try to find our, um, link for our, our guided programs online and we can sign up that way. Uh, we do advertise them a variety of ways, including social media. Sometimes they'll pop up in newspapers, sometimes not. I know we're going to be looking at doing a bio blitz later this year, as well as the city nature challenge. So we'll have some good events for those. Uh, Kathy L. Yeah. The graffiti on the rocks. Who do we report that to? Um, me. I can give you guys my email. It's pretty easy. I'll put it in chat, but it's just wesley.herman at coloradosprings.gov. Um, you can also report it to just the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Services. Oh, that's to just Tori. Let me give that to everyone. Uh, if you report that to the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Services, there's uh, just find the phone number for that. And I can post that if you'd like, but it'll find its way to me and we'll uh, look at that. 
Um, if you don't mind me asking, I can ask you later if you want to throw that in, but um, we have a lot of graffiti in the historic quarry. I'm looking at doing a cleanup day there in the next couple of weeks, but if you have any graffiti that you've noticed, please feel free to message me in this and I can also take a look for it. Um, I also, yeah, I get pretty frustrated by it. Um. Uh, I don't know if it's Craiger or C. Rager asked about uh, what is the park out east? That is Corral Bluffs. Um, so Corral, like a horse Corral Bluffs. And it's not open to the public yet. We are working on developing it. And uh, if you've been to Red Rock Canyon, you might know that it was open-ish to the public, or at least a lot of people went there prior to it being open. And so one of the issues we have is there's a lot of rogue trails or some people call social trails. We kind of think it's a little too friendly though. So we like rogue trail. Um, so we want to try to develop Corral Bluffs in a, in a thoughtful and planned management way. And being able to do that will help us protect those resources. You can go on guided hikes through COBA, the uh, Corral Bluffs Alliance. So they're kind of our friends group out there and they do have some, uh, some hikes out there. All right. Yeah, there's a lot, and I, I know I flew through a lot of information. I'm happy to go over uh, anything again. Um, any gypsum outcrops? We do have little layers of gypsum. I know that there is some kind of near the Morrison Formation, actually. There's a little bit. Um, and then you might see some little bands of gypsum in those, uh, those sea environments, especially as they dried out. So those pulses of seaways that might actually be getting into like the Glen Cairn. Um, not a lot in terms of like crystals though, more just kind of these little, you might find micro crystals. I mean, like, you know, size of grains of salt, um, but not a lot of those thick layers. They do have a lot of that up at uh, Garden of the Gods. And so there's a lot of history in the carving of those gypsum figurines, uh, a lot of cool history there. I think, uh, the background picture, you know, um, I took this one day when I was out on a patrol, so I don't think this one is like available for sale. Um, happy to, to email it to you or something like that. I just ask for if you're using it for anything, throw a credit there. But uh, this is just a picture I was driving past one day and went, oh, wow, that's nice. Uh, great question on the legal, uh, you know, so in, yeah. How do you know that fossils were legally obtained? That is a, that's a tough one because there is a thriving fossil black market. Uh, some of that really gets into figuring out where the fossils are sourced from. Um, some countries have different laws. Mexico has very strict laws on exporting fossils. Um, and then other countries, you can find a lot of great fossil material like Morocco. Um, and it just depends on the individual laws. I think the best thing to go is going to a reputable fossil dealer, but doing a lot of that research. Um, it's not like diamonds where they have a certifying agency, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, but kind of as you do more research, you can figure out, okay, this is where this came from and this is the, the legality. Um, I'm a shark tooth addict. Um, <laughs> I don't even call myself a collector anymore. Uh, but a lot of the shark teeth I get are out of the South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida area. And so I've actually met some of the people that collect. And if you can meet the collectors um, and talk to them, you can learn a lot about the legality and what they've collected. I've also been on field trips out to uh, some of the national grasslands and national forests where you are allowed to collect fossils and just learned a lot from some of my paleo nerd friends about what I'm allowed to do, what I'm not allowed to do. Um, but as with anything, I think research, research, research. So thank you guys very much. And uh, also thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. Yes. Oh, man, uh, Susan, I, <laughs> I've been to that show so many times. I think the first time I was 13 years old when I went to the Gem and Mineral Show. So that is a great way to get into it. If you are interested in collecting, um, there are people there who they will have more knowledge than I'll ever be able to get a fraction of. So they're, it's, it's incredible how smart these people are and how hyper-focused in on their little areas. I know a guy who all he collects is tourmalines from one mine in California, and he knows everything about that, but a lot of the other stuff he knows a good amount about, but he's just like hyper-focused on this one mine. So yeah, that's a great, great idea. Gem and mineral shows are another great way to learn about this.
And it looks like we had um, Garden of the Gods, that's your name, was raising their hand. I don't know if you wanted to unmute and ask a question or type it in the chat. This is Garden of the Gods, might be some of my old colleagues. <laughs> Okay, they said no thanks. Well, Wesley, thank okay. you so much. That was such an awesome presentation. I grew up here and I never knew half the stuff you just told. So that's really awesome. Um, and I will go ahead, I will send the link to the video recording on Monday once it's posted. If uh, you don't get my email or you don't see it, it will be on our YouTube channel. It's just PPLD um, on YouTube and we'll have it all listed there. And then we do have a copy of the Nova episode you were talking about. So I put a link to that in the chat as well. So thank you so much. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me later. Um, or Wesley, he put his email there in the chat. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, thanks for letting me come out here and talk today. But also, uh, thanks for letting me geek out. I had a great time. Um, I actually got to go out and take pictures for about four hours earlier this week. So um, I had, it was, it, was a, it was a blast to get to go out and focus on the rocks again. Well, and thank you so much. I know we're all kind of cooped up. You know, we have been for a long time. So to see something virtual was, was really awesome. So thanks so much, Wesley. And thank you all for coming. Have a great rest of your day.